used to probe human nature. No. How can we tell if this magician really has psychic powers? What is the placebo effect and why is it important? Do you have any money with you right now that you have taken from the desk? No. Can we trust the results of a lie detector? Understanding research, this time on discovering psychology. Psychologists face a difficult task when they set out to understand the nature of behavior and the workings of the brain and mind. This researcher is trying to draw an accurate picture of the brain's electrical activity associated with different mental illnesses. But he and his colleagues have one strong ally that makes success possible, the scientific method, a set of general procedures for gathering and interpreting data. Keep your eyes closed. Open. To be accurate, data must be collected from carefully controlled observations and measurements. And other researchers working independently must be able to obtain the same results using the same methods. What kinds of places do you usually go to when you want to meet somebody either that you want to have a relationship with? Interviews, or surveys, questionnaires, and psychological tests are some of the methods psychologists use to explore our personalities, values, talents, and the effects of our environment. Take, for example, the work of psychologist Christina Maslach of the University of California at Berkeley. She applies research methods to study job burnout, where stress, lack of support, and negative self-evaluation impair job performance and personal well-being. Dr. Maslach uses psychometric research, a system of developing a standardized method for collecting data and assessing psychological phenomena. This is research that started in the real world. But what it meant was that we were doing interviews, we were doing surveys, we were going out into the workplace trying to understand what it was that people were experiencing. Look at this one. We would then develop new versions of the surveys or interview questions and eventually began to develop a standardized measure of the phenomenon that we were getting. And so there was a whole uh, period of psychometric research. We got terrific results in terms of how many... By refining her methodology, uh, Dr. Maslach has developed a scale to measure job burnout. The scale is a practical implementation of her research that she brings into the workplace to assist others in making their work environments more effective. What I have done is begun to move towards an applied research with organizations rather than just with individuals where we provide them with the tools to do an organizational self-assessment on the health of the workplace. One of the exciting things about going out and working in these different organizations or doing the interviews is that I always come back with some new insights or new questions, and that kind of fuels the research. It's exciting to be able to see this process, this partnership, go back and forth so you think we're making progress. We're actually learning something that is, is making a difference for people. By adapting her research to address the concerns of our workplace environments, Dr. Maslach demonstrates that real life is one kind of laboratory where both the subjects and the researcher reap the benefits. Some psychologists conduct experiments in laboratories like this one, designed for carefully controlling conditions and measuring behavior. The laboratory is one place where scientists test hypotheses, that is, predictions of how two or more factors are likely to be related. To test a hypothesis, researchers randomly assign some subjects to an experimental group which receives the treatment. Other subjects are assigned to the control group that does not receive the treatment. The results are then compared. Other research is carried out in the field where naturally occurring ongoing behavior can be observed. 
This researcher is studying how the social behavior of baboons affects their health. Psychological research is also conducted in locations as unusual as this Air Force flight simulator. One of the most important tasks you can be asked to perform as a fighter pilot is to visually identify features and markings on another airplane. If you look at the aircraft, cover your left eye and read what you see, please. All right. F, D, T, L, T. Wherever it happens and whatever methods are used, basic psychological research carried out scientifically gives us a good shot at the truth. And if we understand how these researches separate fact from fiction, perhaps we too can avoid some of the pitfalls of faulty reasoning and unwarranted conclusions in our everyday lives. The point here is not to make you all practicing psychologists, but to make you better consumers of would-be facts and theories, especially those you take for granted. One of the most remarkable things about us humans is how many of our beliefs we accept without question. These beliefs form a subjective reality that can influence how we perceive the world. They can affect our everyday plans, whom we choose to associate with and trust, and even our health. Some of our beliefs come from our culture. For example, what it teaches us about male and female roles, beauty, and courage. And each culture has its own belief systems and sense of humor. Lactel, les mamelles de la France. Other powerful beliefs come from each individual's experiences and motivations, developed through personal interaction with the world. Yeah. Our individual experience may also include the learning of critical thinking skills, so that we can test our beliefs against scientific understanding. What did you decide for the main ideas from what you read? They danced around the fire louder, louder, and faster, and faster. If we don't learn how to think critically, we may believe in the unproven and the unexplained. Or become willing recruits in a never-ending stream of religious, social, and political cults. True believers who blindly accept authority rather than think for themselves. Research reveals that for many of the 25 million Americans without high school diplomas, the world can be a confusing and threatening place. These people often feel that they are controlled by fate and can do little to control their own lives. Many of them are also inclined to believe in psychic predictions, mystical forces, and cosmic signs, as do some better educated people. In fact, Belief in mystical forces, such as Haitian voodoo, can be so potent that it can transform psychological and biological reality, for better or for worse. It can sometimes cure the sick or kill the healthy. At the Johns Hopkins University, common features shared by miracle cures, faith healing, political and religious conversions, and psychotherapy are studied by research psychiatrist Jerome Frank. All forms of psychological healing that is trying to influence people through words share certain common healing features. Uh, I guess the first of those is a kind of relationship with a healer, a person who inspires confidence in the patient, builds a, makes him feel he can trust him, uh, uh, inspires the patient's hopes, it's a very important ingredient. And then there's always a healing setting of some kind, almost always, a shrine, let us say, or a doctor's office, or a clinic even were sort of cemented down to the floor. In action, frozen. There is a third that I guess they have in common, and that's the increase of patient's sense of mastery, of, of control over what's happening. See, the thing human beings can least stand is chaos. 
That's the most frightening experience there is. And anything that gives a pe people a sense that they're in, in control again is a very important boost to their morale. And mentioning that one brings up a, a common feature of all these procedures, and that is if they work at all, they do it through arousing the person emotionally. He feels things as a result, happy or sad or frightened or angry. Mainly, I would say relief, sometimes anxiety, because you get into areas that make him more anxious, make him or her more anxious than before. Belief is really crucial to all the to a healing process of any sort, because without the belief, the person does not participate in any sense of, in any real way. They may go through the motions, they may listen politely, as many patients do, but nothing happens to them unless they really believe this can, that this can help them. Sometimes it is the power of this belief that a treatment will work that results in the cure, and not any special power of the supposed treatment itself. The scientific term for this phenomenon is the placebo effect. In medicine, a placebo is a substance such as a sugar pill that has no direct pharmacological effect but which can have a therapeutic effect on pain and sickness in people who believe it will work. History suggests that placebos have been responsible for much of the therapeutic success of treatments throughout the centuries. In ancient Egypt, patients were often treated with lizard's blood and crocodile dung. Later, physicians used leeches to suck the blood of patients or made their patients vomit, or froze them, or overheated them. Many of these patients died. But those who survived often swore by their treatment. Just think of how many more testimonials there might have been if these physicians had been content to use just sugar pills. Okay. Placebos can be so effective that virtually any credible, socially sanctioned treatment administered in an appropriate context can have a moderate success. Okay, I didn't even feel that. Rays come out from your body, from that okay. center. Even but the mere believable so suggestion that a treatment will work is sufficient to make about one-third of sick people so feel better, according so to recent studies. You can imagine, though, how the placebo effect complicates the job of a researcher. How do you know whether it's a specific treatment that's working or just the fact of being given any treatment? One solution is what's known as the double-blind procedure. You give some subjects the real treatment and others the placebo and don't tell them which is which. In fact, even the researcher or therapist giving out the treatment can't know, so the results won't be biased. Sometimes, of course, the problem isn't bias, but outright fraud. Every year, so-called miracle healers deceive thousands of sick people. These charlatans want to make money, not provide cures. Unexplained phenomena, especially if you don't look too closely, are the foundation of alleged psychic powers, miracle cures, UFOs, and all sorts of crackpot theories. But they're also the professional magician's stock and trade. So for some tips on explaining the unexplainable, we turn to a man who always has something up his sleeve, the amazing Daryl Bem. I would like to present a demonstration of mind reading not one in which I read someone else's mind, but one in which Lisa attempts to read my mind. I have here a set of cards. Mm -hmm. I have one of the cards in mind. You do not know which one that is. I want you to concentrate and then touch any particular card that appeals to you. This card. Okay, do you care to change your mind? No. You have selected the Jack of Diamonds. Believe it or not, you have read my mind. And you have read my chest. <laughs> Can we conclude that a psychic event has taken place? What would a psychologist say? Let's ask Daryl Bem. In real life, I'm a psychologist, not an illusionist. And as any psychologist can tell you, the demonstration you've just seen is the worst way to do an experiment. Nevertheless, it enables me to mention some of the things that a psychologist would use to safeguard the hypothesis that's being tested. Let us suppose that psychologists did want to test the hypothesis that Lisa and I did have some kind of psychic communication. Before one could even entertain such a hypothesis, one would first have to rule out two other possibilities. The first one you rule out is that it was merely chance, that only chance was operating. We had six cards in this case. By pure coincidence, it could have been one out of six. Would that have convinced you? 
it wouldn't have convinced psychologists either. Let us suppose that the psychologists have now ruled out that the demonstration you saw was just due to chance. Again, we are not ready to conclude that what you have seen is something psychic, because there are many alternative possibilities. If this were to be done as an actual experiment, I would never be permitted to be in the same room with Lisa. These are called procedural controls, and that is the second thing that a psychologist always tries to do, rule out alternative hypotheses. Another safeguard that we didn't put into place was that I didn't tell you ahead of time what the hypothesis was. I told you that we had psychic communication, but I didn't tell you which card would constitute evidence for that psychic communication. Did you notice that it wasn't until she had turned over the Jack of Diamonds that I announced that that was the correct card and showed you my t-shirt. Perhaps it occurred to you that I have 52 t-shirts. Not actually, but I did something quite comparable. Suppose, for example, that she had not selected the Jack of Diamonds. Suppose instead that she had selected a different card, the Five of Clubs. Since she didn't know the plot line ahead of time, I simply would have said that's exactly the card I was thinking of the five of clubs. And so I would have been correct even if she had selected that one. Suppose she had selected a different card, the four of spades. In that case, I simply would have said that's exactly the one I was thinking of. And so forth. And so in fact there was never any possibility. The chance was operating. I don't leave things to chance. But a psychologist who well designed an experiment would have ruled out all of these things. Here's where experimental research comes in. When a number of factors might be responsible for an observed effect, and we want to know which one deserves the credit, then we have to do an experiment. The essence of an experiment is systematic manipulation or variation of one or more factors while holding constant all the others that might be important. The effects of these manipulated events on some behavioral reaction are then assessed. So even when we know a dramatic change has occurred, we can't assume to know why. And we also have to resist the temptation to conclude that things that are correlated, that occur together, are causally related. Many things that seem to be related as cause and effect aren't. Often it's a third factor that's causing the other two. For instance, when we learn that children's grades on achievement tests go down, as the number of hours they spend watching television goes up, we can't conclude that TV causes bad grades, or that the key to better grades is parents turning off the TV set. Instead, it could be that less able students watch more television because they don't like school and homework, in which case being less able causes their bad grades. Good students may also watch a lot of TV. Another potential problem in analyzing data comes from using small samples to draw significant conclusions. At the moment, no. just the phenomenon at this just the point. the phenomenon itself, uh, if we could de demonstrate it reliably. Psychologists typically measure a few responses of a small number of subjects in experiments and try to infer something important about human or animal behavior in general. To reduce the possibility of errors, researchers start out with a sample of subjects that is representative of the larger population from which the sample was drawn. The best way to assure this is to draw randomly, by chance. Otherwise, the research may be seriously flawed. Consider Women and Love, a controversial study of women's attitudes towards sex and marriage, which made headlines across the country. According to the author of the study, Cher Height, 98% of married women said they were dissatisfied with some major aspect of their relationship, and 75% said they had had extramarital affairs. But only 4% of the women who received height survey had mailed in their responses. And these women may well have been motivated to reply because they were unhappy, making the sample hopelessly biased. When the same questions that Cher Height asked were posed to a sample of women who were randomly selected, the results were very different. According to a survey by ABC News and the Washington Post, 93% said they were satisfied with their relationships, and only 7% reported having affairs. So beware of science-coded journalism, where numbers are used to convey the aura of science, but the methods used to collect them are flawed. 
And while we're at it, let's beware of pseudoscientific technology as well. This is a polygraph test, better known as a lie detector test. Every year, over two million Americans take one. But does it work? Psychologist Leonard Sachs of Boston University is an expert on the use and misuse of polygraphs. Unfortunately, hundreds of thousands, millions of people are subjected to these tests. They, it determines whether they get jobs, it determines whether they go to jail, it determines whether they get custody of their children, it determines whether they can work in the most important uh, positions in our government and the most sensitive positions in our government. And the problem is that the test doesn't work. It's not a valid test. It can be defeated. It can be wrong. Is today May 26th? Yes. The instrument that's used as a polygraph measures some very simple measures of what's called autonomic arousal person's heart rate, a uh, person's sweating, and the rate of breathing? No. The tester asks a number of control questions the where the subject is assumed to tell the truth. The subject's arousal is then compared the to his arousal in response to relevant questions where he may be lying. Have you ever taken something that didn't belong to you before? No. People who lie are sometimes nervous and sometimes their heart goes faster and sometimes they sweat more. But it's also true that people who are just concerned about an issue show the same reactions. Vice versa, it's also true that people who lie sometimes don't sweat, don't have their heart racing. And so um, there's no direct connection and there's no um, unequivocal connection between lying and these physiological states of arousal. Recently, Congress asked Sachs and his colleagues to test the validity of lie detectors. Sachs set up an experiment where subjects were allowed to take money from a desk drawer. They were then given a lie detector test. If they could pass the test, they could keep the money. No. Do you have any money with you right now that you have taken from the desk? No. Some subjects were told that any lie detector can be deceived. Others were told that this lie detector was always accurate. The results were clear. Those who believed that the polygraph test did not work were able to deceive it. Those who believed it worked were for the most part caught, and some innocent subjects failed the test. No. A polygraph is a prop. It's a theatrical device, if you will. If a polygrapher can convince the subject, and they're very good at convincing people, if they can convince the subject that the test works, if the subject is guilty, they're going to uh, be nervous. They're going to think that they can be detected. If, on the other hand, the subject knows that this is just theater, that the polygrapher can't really tell what they're thinking, they're not going to be afraid. They're not going to be nervous about being caught. Clearly, getting at the truth is a difficult proposition. But fortunately, there are a few guidelines we can follow to avoid the most common pitfalls. First, find out who the subjects were in any study, how many of them participated, and how they were selected. Avoid the assumption that two things that go together are cause and effect. Correlation is not necessarily causation. Remember that seeing isn't believing if important information might be kept from you. Question any data that aren't collected using the rigorous procedures of the scientific method. Any conclusion about human behavior is only as good as the data on which it is based. Keep in mind the power of placebos to alter reality. Restrain your enthusiasm for scientific breakthroughs until the results have been replicated by other researchers. And above all, Beware of people claiming absolute truth and simple solutions for the many uncertainties and complexities of human nature. Scientific conclusions are always tentative, never absolute, and open to change should better data come along. In our next program, we're going to use our critical thinking to explore the very core of psychology, the brain, 
It's the biological base of all our actions, thoughts, and feelings. It's the hardware that controls the most noble deeds of the most advanced species on Earth and the most primitive instincts of the simplest animals. The brain and behavior. Next time on Discovering Psychology. I'm Philip Zimbardo.